Hello everyone, nice to meeting you today, even though it is online lecture. My presentation today will address onboard training and training ships. Before we start, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Jin Soo Park, and I'm an emeritus professor from the Korea Maritime and Ocean University. I have graduated from the Nautical Science Department at the Korea Maritime University in 1977. After graduation in 1977, I started my seafaring career as a deck officer. Starting off from third mate and working my way up to chief mate. I resigned from the sea service in 1981 and started my job on shore working for shipping companies between 1981 and 1986. Then in late 1986, I was fortunate enough to join the Korea Maritime University. And thereafter, I have worked for the university for over 30 years until my retirement a couple of years ago in February 2019. So now I'm a retired professor. Consequently, I have spent 10 years in the shipping industry and 32 years in the maritime education. You can find out my email address here at the bottom for any question you may have or if you would like to contact me and find out more details about my areas of teaching and research interest. So for today's agenda, the contents of the lecture will include an introduction at the start before going over to explain onboard training and its case in Korea. Finally, I will finish up with a summary and conclude the main point of the lecture. Let's get started. To begin with, in the introduction part, I will introduce the background of the onboard training system and the sea training system in other countries before taking a look at Korea's case. In the slide here, you can see the background information on sea training. Deck officers are required to complete 12 months of approved seagoing service in order to receive COC, which is a professional certificate of competency, while marine engineers are also required to complete at least six months of engine room watchkeeping during the 12 months period. So, in both instances, sea training is a mandatory requirement in order to acquire the COC. Now, in the case of cadets, they can be trained on training ships and or on merchant ships. And each one has its own merits and demerits. First, the contents and or level of sea training can be adjusted in order to align with the school education programs on training ships more so than on merchant ships. Second, practical learning efficiency is extremely high on merchant ships. Third, cadets' overall performance is more consistent on training ships. Fourth, Merchant ships have traditionally recorded higher possibility for employment with direct employment links. Fifth, and lastly, the training period on merchant ships is fixed, while on training ships, it can be adjusted to suit the needs of the cadet. The sea training system for cadet can be divided into two main categories, which are continuous training and multi-stage training. Even though each one has its own merits and demerits, as you may observe on this slide, 
the overall training achievement of the multi-stage training system is comparatively higher than that of the continuous state training. Korea, China, Ukraine, the Philippines, India, and Myanmar have adopted the continuous state training system, while the UK, USA, Russia, Poland, and Japan has adopted the multi-stage training system. Now, we are going to take a look at a survey conducted on international training ships by Mr. Nam in 2016. The survey carried out through the website of IAMU members on training ships above 1,000 gross tons. According to the analysis results, a large number of IAMU member universities have no adequate training ships. Korea, Japan, USA, Russia, Poland, China, Thailand, and others were the subject where exclusive training ships for cadet training are operated. However, each one has different characteristics, as I will now describe. One, in Korea's case, each MET institute owns own operate training ships, and there is a sufficient number of ships to accommodate all cadets who spend six months on training ships and six months on merchant ships. Two, Japan and Thailand. Each has training centers run by the government, which owns and operate training ships. And MET Institute send their cadet to those training centers. Third case, Russia and Poland's MET Institute owns and operate traditional sail training ships. Four, MET Institute in the USA own and operate retired Navy and Coast Guard ships. However, they have started to build new training ships now. And China generally has training on come merchant ships. In the slide here, you can see information on the age and the size of 42 training ships that have been surveyed and analyzed, which include 26 exclusive training ships, 11 sail training ships, and five training cum cargo ships. With an average size of 5,324 gross tons and an average age of 32 years. Now, we will continue on to take a look at Korea's case of onboard training. All right, first of all, shall we take a look into the history of the Korea Maritime and Ocean University training ships in Busan, Korea? KMOU used the YMS as their training ship between 1947 and 1950. The YMS is a yard-class minesweeper which is a wooden boat built in 1941 in the United States. She was recalled in for support during the Korean War in 1950. Nevertheless, the steamship Bando, which has served between 1960 and 1974 for about 15 years, has been recognized as the first training ship in Korea. She was 23-year-old cargo ship when she was delivered to KMOU and was converted at the time into a cargo come training ship. She could accommodate 100 cadets all at once and through the time had about 1,000 cadets trained on her all together. On to the next slide here, I will introduce Hanbada and Hanara to special purpose built ships. Hambada 1 was the first exclusive training ship in KMOU. She was built in Japan in 1975 and had 174 training birds. She has served for 30 whole years up until 2005 and had over 6,000 cadets trained on. In 1993, another training ship, Hanara 1, 
was built at Taesan Shipyard in Busan in preparation to meet the new standard introduced by the International Convention, STCW. The sea training period for cadet increased from six months to 12, and the dual purpose officers were to be trained on automated ships according to the newly adopted STCW convention. The size of Hanara 1 is similar to that of Hanbada 1, but with an automation class of UMA second. Hanara 1 has a separate cadet training bridge and the cadet training engine control room as well. She had 152 training berths and 4,530 cadets trained on during her 26 years of service. In 2005, KMOU has introduced the new Hanbada 2 built in the STX shipyard in Korea to replace the old Hanbada 1. Hanbada 2 is much larger than the old ship at 6,686 gross ton and classed as a UM-3 automated ship that can accommodate 204 cadets altogether at once. In 2019, KMOU has also replaced the old Hanara 1 with the new Hanara 2 built in Hanjin shipyard in Korea. Hanara 2 is also much larger than the old ship at 9,196 gross ton and classed at the Nox tier 3 ship that has recorded 206 training berths. Both Hanbada 2 and Hanara 2 are still in service today. After looking at the training ships at KMOU, we will now go over the sea training programs available at KMOU. Each training ship sails two cruise and ten coastal voyages per year, mounting to a total of four months at sea and eight months in port. The cadets are divided into four groups, three watch teams and one day work team, during their time at sea. During this time, each group learns an exercise on the bridge and practice engine room watchkeeping. The program also include practical work and lectures simultaneously. The cadet practice efficient and suitable training patterns with six months on the training ship and another six months on the merchant ship under the supervision and guidance of Korean ship owners and operators. Now, let's look into the training ship's budget. The construction cost of Hanara 1 was about 17 million US dollars, while the cost of Hanbada 2 was more than double, that at about 39 million US dollars. This is mainly due to the bigger size and difference in automation level, among other reasons. Let's take a look at the operating cost in 2018, excluding the salaries for the crew, lecturers, etc. The operating cost was divided into five categories, which are port charges, repair and maintenance, supplies, bunkers, and insurance premiums. The total operating cost of Hanara 1 is about $1.1 million, while Hanbada 2 is about $1.4 million per year. And yes, it has been proved that training ships cost a great deal of money to build and maintain. The table here shows us the statistics from onboard training during a recent five-year period from 2015 to 2019. Each cell figure indicates the number of cadets in that respective year. Please take a look at the figures in the right-hand column at the end. In the first cell, 1 to 5 indicate the average number of cadets trained on Hanbada, and below in the second cell is the average number of cadets trained on Hanara with 94 cadets. In the meantime, an average of 201 cadets were trained on merchant ships. And 37 engineering cadets 
as practical workshop training. The average total of cadet per year was 458. Okay? We have almost reached the end of today's lecture. So let's do a quick summary and conclusion. The maritime transportation sector cannot survive on its own. It must have the support of various subsidiary industries and associated services. Subsidiary industries include shipbroking, shipping agencies, ship leasing, ship management, marine insurance, and maritime law services. Associate services include shipyard, classification societies, ship engine and part business, ship repairs, ship supplies, speed ordering, and many more. There may be uh, numerous ways and methods to train and supply maritime workforce. In Korea's case, graduate from the Maritime University start their career on board as ship officers for several years and build up knowledge and understanding of maritime industry from their own world. After gaining onboard experience and service at sea, they can continue their maritime career at sea. Although many ship officers choose to move to work on shore at different sectors of the maritime industry, many join shipping companies as on onshore staff and some join subsidiary industries and associated maritime services. In the meantime, other graduates may go into the public sector, including maritime administration, ministry, coast guard agency, maritime education training, or research institute. In 2013, Korea had 1,576 ships accounting for 75 million deadweight tons, which made up 4.7% of the global fleet and ranked fifth in the world. However, in 2019, Korea registered more than 1,600 ships, accounting for nearly 77 million deadweight and dropped in ranking down to seventh. Many Koreans agree that graduates from the Korea Maritime University have played a very important role in leading the development of the Korean shipping industry. And now I would like to emphasize once more that education, training, and supply of qualified workforce at the right time is the most important driving force for the development of the nation's economy, which doesn't have sufficient natural resources. Before we finish, I would like to mention two of the most significant benefits of the Korean maritime education and training system. First, it is part of the national university system. And the second, it is a tripartite cooperative system between the university, the shipping industry, and the government which means that food, accommodation, uniform, and part of the tuition fees are funded by the government. In addition, graduates may get exemption from their military service, while training ships, operation, and maintenance costs are also funded by government. Furthermore, shipping industries provide various scholarships and free onboard train opportunities while the government provides full financial support and training ships. And the university devotes itself to deliver trained and qualified workforce in return. It is surely an effective and prevailing system for success. This concludes today's lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that the lecture was helpful and provided you with some insight on how you can apply yourself to onboard training in the future. 
If you have any questions or would like to know more about the maritime industry in Korea, please feel free to send me an email and I will do my best to answer any of your questions. Thank you again for your time.